Hey everyone! Hi Welcome guys! Welcome to the JT Music Podcast episode zero 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 one. That yeah. means we're gonna hit ten thousand episodes. Like Joe Rogan, here we Indeed. come. So we're we're gonna be lofty with this. No, this is the JT Music Podcast. This is uh, our our foray into this. This is something we've always played with. Mm-hmm. Um, We've done know, a few podcasts yeah. before. Everybody's got to have a podcast yeah. now. But we figured, you know, since we have a pretty big platform on YouTube yeah. making content, why not just sit down and talk about it? We already kind of do this with our, our Patreon yep. stuff. So we were like, hey, this would be a good idea. And it'd be fun for us to do. So Yeah, we've been doing uh, Patreon podcasts for a year and a half now. They're like 20-ish minute podcasts that kind of go in the full just details of projects, I guess. So that's stuff we won't like... We'll go into pro- details of projects of like now and behind us, but on that we we go way hard, way ahead and we talk about things that are got to keep stuff exclusive yeah, years for the pa- for the patrons. Exactly, but it, yeah. but um, as a general so. podcast, this is not going to be too structured. It's just us talking. There will be times where we'll have different themings and and stuff and topics we'll talk about or people we bring in or whatever. Mm-hmm. But we're really just here uh, shooting the shit. Um, you know, and if we go off the rails, then cool. You know, generally we will have a topic on this one. It's just the history of JT music. We've covered it many times, um, but it's always in short form. So we've never had a platform to just talk and we can kind of go through and meander and, and find different different branching paths and whatever. I don't know. We, yeah, it, just go, see where it takes us. That's my favorite part about podcasts is when they go off the rails. Yeah. So, but yeah, for this, for episode 000 alpha, <laughs> we figured uh, this would be a good place to point people when they say, how'd you start YouTube? How'd you yep. get into video production or music production? Yeah, we can um, maybe turn turn some of it into talking about, I don't know, like the, the FAQs people have about being a YouTuber or content creation, you know, because mm-hmm. we get those a lot. <laughs> it's uh, the, the questions we get have, have been through the years have just become for the f- same five questions. And so we off the bat, top of my head, I'll be able to just kind of share with you guys what those are and what our answers always are. Yeah. But um, let's go Should back to the very beginning of the, the JT Music story. The very beginning. Yeah. It was a cold night, November 7th, 1990. Just kidding. I'm not going to start with my birth. But yeah, <laughs> we, we were... start with your conception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we were, bo- we were best friends from like grade two. We went to Chuck E. Cheese. I guess if we're really starting at the beginning, when we met, we met in elementary school. And uh, we went to Chuck E. Cheese, which is pretty fitting because one of the most yep. popular content on our channel would one day become Five Nights at Freddy's. So it's pretty funny. We didn't realize that till like a couple years ago, how funny it was that we became best friends at Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. Is that, is um, that irony? Is that a proper usage of irony? <laughs> dude, I, I, that's so ironic. I think it's closer than what <laughs> no, a lot it's of people. Meta. Yeah. It's meta. It dude. is. Yeah. Um, I keep oh. putting my hands up, but then I'm blocking the shadow. So we have a fourth light. We have these light things, and the fourth one is off getting repaired. And we get that. That will be on top of us, kind of giving us some top light. But right now, we're like scary people. <laughs> so we, oh, we got to have a ghost stories episode. But sure. anyways, anyways, uh, back on the rails. Uh, we met at Chuck E. Cheese. We don't have to go into all the details of our friendship growing up. But yeah, well, that's I lied. I lied to him. I was trying to impress like these. It was him and his friend. Uh, you're a whole grade above you yeah, we a, were in second grade yes. i think you were in first so i was intimidated to. so i made up yeah. a lie about banjo kazooie yep. how there's a secret ending where if something if you beat is it trudy uh gr- grunty, grunty the witch grunty the witch she like picks her nose and flicks the booger at you or something and you have to the booger yeah i remember yeah. you telling me that and honestly the lie worked because i was like oh this kid is like good at He's video a gamer. games like this is a real gamer so it worked um but yeah we became friends from that point on we discovered we had a lot of similar like yeah. creative like uh outlets like writing stories making drawing. Like, legos drawing was probably the biggest one at first yep. um so yeah we always had creative outlets and then in high school john moved down here to north carolina where we both live now and it was devastating. Like, I remember when I found out that your family was moving, I, my mom told me like, oh, the Gillardis are moving to North Carolina. I was like, nah, like yeah. I did. I thought she was just messing with me. So it really sucked. Like we lived down the street from each other back in our hometown in Maine too. Um, so a way we kept in touch was playing Xbox together. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of why you got the Xbox or part of it like was the part justification. Of, yeah. Yeah. No, it and was. so we, we just, we were able to play Halo. I think Halo and World at War were the big ones at first. Mm-hmm. And then 
kind of rewinding a bit, you were always playing with um, Garage Band, yeah, making music with your with our buddy Sean and Will. Sean and Will, yeah, we were we Tom, were kind of <laughs> yeah, and it's funny all as all, there's the, the group of four, three are the musically inclined ones, and then Tom went more into into production and yep and that stuff. But it's, that's funny, I didn't think about that. <laughs> well, it, yeah, we started even back then because, like I say all the time now, my favorite part of what I do is making beats. And even back then, when we were making goofy raps, like my favorite part was finishing a beat and showing it to Sean and Will and being like, "Oh, check out this beat. We got to make a sick rap over it." So. So I started doing that for fun while you were starting to get into like video capturing and like yeah. making your own montages. Dude, I still love your first mm-hmm. montage ever. Yeah. That's, oh. So I, so good. I don't, I mean, I just played Battlefield a bunch and I maybe would watch Battlefield. I don't know what inspired me, but I got a HD PVR or no, it was a Pinnacle Studio Plus thing. I got it at Best Buy. Like I got a capture card at Best Buy and you like plugged in the RGB things into your from the console into that device and then you put that device in your tv and it projected the console signal through to your computer and then back to your tv mm-hmm. so that's how you record it and that's what hd pvrs ended up being and obviously that stuff's changed now with elgato and all that stuff simplified but i just had that and i would record gameplay and i was testing it out and i had it was on a laptop and my dad played video games um a lot of call of duty so he was playing call cod 4 I was just recording his footage and then I played around with it and made this stupid montage oh, with, with like graphics cheesy and edits yeah, and cheesy edits and transitions. Just like per, someone who has zero anything with video editing, you're going to use, you're going to use the cheesy intros oh, and, yeah. and our, uh, d- uh, transitions and stuff. And there was a part where he jumped down onto like a pipe from like a second story and shot a guy. And, and when he did, when he did that, I wrote Geronimo in a title, like a stupid stocked like title too. With the wavy font. Yeah. Uh, no, I, uh, I missed I think that. The, I think it was enter Sandman was the song for it too. Of course. And I timed a, a no scope kill to the drop. So that was cool. That's pretty, that was sick. my first kind of video. That was my first edit. And that's kind of what kickstarted me. And yeah, I would just make montages. I just would do battlefield and, I think it's just Battlefield. I was like a Battlefield montage guy and my gameplay wasn't that good. But, you know, I remember getting, having a video crawling and crawling. I was like, oh my God, it's got a thousand views. Oh, it's got 2000. Eventually yeah. hit 10,000 over this summer. I was like, oh my God. And, and it's, that was a lot then too. Not even just like a lot for, for someone who's starting from nothing, like just a, like an uploader. Oh yeah. Back like that was like, when, that was like, like 2007. Tw- yeah. Like yeah. 20,000 subs then like, not to not to downplay it at all now, but like it meant a lot, you know, it meant oh. a lot more than say twenty thousand is today. Yeah, because so, I remember you had like you had before I even started my Skull Cruncher channel, which became the JT. Mm-hmm. It you had like thousands of subscribers just yeah. from like like your montages, and you would upload like a clip from a TV show. I think that yeah, I would up, I would upload TV clips too. Hey, that's cool. But you also had your montages and like. Dude, I, I, cause I want to expound upon that magic of like creating something out like th- that magical feeling when oh, you yeah. started editing, when you take oh, yeah. footage of gameplay and like you realize that like, oh, I can like create a story or like it's, it's such a magical feeling. Yeah. Like when, like, oh, yeah. I don't know, expound upon that. I want to hear your experience I mean, with it. Obviously the, the montages, you can only go so far uh in terms of of that but so like there's that untapped kind of wanting to do more or having more control over the edit you know and i was i was shy and i especially at that time having moved to a new area and being pretty introverted i didn't have a lot of friends let alone friends that had that overlapping interest and so the act like not the act but the machinima the medium not the company but machinima machine cinema using pre-rendered video game assets or just any kind of pre assets to make things, you know, um, was available, you know, and that was through halo. And, you know, we, we had both been red versus blue fans in the mid two thousands too. So that was a big part of that. And, and knowing that that was, you were able to do that, you know, and and you could, you could fudge it too, because there wasn't a machinima mode. You just go on, in the multiplayer thing and, and you know, would you crop out the, the HUD and, and lower the gun because then the gun would be out of the, um, what's it? Or the, the gun frame. would be, the arms would be lowered. The gun would be still on the screen. So you would green, you would kind of black bar that in the HUD. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I knew that was a thing. Halo three had theater mode 
And so it was a match made in heaven for me to play around with that. And so, um, just learn the power of editing. It's, it's just putting things together that tell a story or that, that just things juxtaposed next to each other can have a different meaning than them alone. And, uh, I don't know. The best example was like an old man, um, just looking out the window, smiling. It's like, ah, it's a nice day. And then, and and then the same thing, old man. And then looking at a kid on at the playground, it's like, ugh. like it, it's such a different thing. And that's a, like probably the best example of of editing that they use in call in school. Yeah, it, you remember it. But anyways, it's just I learned that naturally through playing with Halo theater mode, and I did like a car chase or something, and just putting different things together, and realizing I could string it along. And it's not like the best but the video is still up there but it's like there's a cohesive kind of action thing and, and action sequence and and all that and it's just cool it, it's just having an eye for it i guess but it's not that i intrinsically have this eye for it i think you just have to understand what looks good and try and emulate that and halo machinima is the best place was at least at the time the best place to really build up that skill set yeah. and then you know you can go to film school and learn about different types of stuff like establishing shots or reverse shots or the 180 degree rule, like all these different technicalities, but I know you can get away with it. You do kind of have to have an eye and a rhythm for it because I was also, we both went to film school, which we'll talk a lot about on this podcast, I'm sure. But like, I've learned a lot over the years and my, but our buddy Joey actually, I think was the first person to point out to me that like producing music electronically, like how I, how I do it is very similar to editing too. Cause mm. it's not just having the eye, it's having the rhythm too. Yep. Editing is actually a lot of rhythm, yep. um, Pacing. but it's something you've just got to be kind of <laughs> you, like, like John was saying, you can go to film school and stuff, but you do kind of have to naturally have an, an a knack for it, but also a passion for it mm-hmm. too. Cause like, dude, the, cause I, before I started, making music I also was big into like editing just like stupid goofy videos that I'd make with my buddies in high school and like that magic of realizing like taking something stupid we shot and then I'm taking the footage and making something kind of funny out of it just with the editing like having that realization in my hand that like oh editing isn't just the final step there's a lot I can do here yeah um, it's like this, it gives our, our creative boners just, pfft, I mean, um, even to touch on that old man example, you could have filmed something of your friend making a stupid face, like out of the sequel, like, like you, like you're but before you actually shoot the scene or whatever, your friend makes a stupid face, but you realize you could take that clip and overlay it as a reaction. And it's like something you never intended that like no one shot, but it's like some a little thing that you can put in and spruce up that adds a lot to it or something like that. Yeah. Like it becomes, it's more malleable than you think simply editing. And, and I think there's also a misunderstanding for, um, just people who don't know it, Like editing is simply the arrangement of the footage almost. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and then there's a, there's like after effects and special effects, color grading, all these different things, um, are kind of separate. They, they, they can kind of shorthand to be lumped in, but I think we're talking simply about like, the placing and the, the pacing and or, yeah the structure structure is. of the story or or song whatever it is yeah, yeah. The, the, which is yeah all our music videos are it's just there's nothing fancy like there's rarely motion graphic titles typography stuff it's just the best version i can make of just the right things paced together you know and it, it can get hard because there's limited footage or whatever you play with what you got mm-hmm. but i think you know that's the best example of it i think is how not to not to shit on myself but playing the videos are you know compared to like what some of the guys are doing now with the anime yeah. but i still think it works because it's just good pacing and i think that's all it takes yeah no um, for sure also uh, too late but let's do it for the sake of it <laughs> especially if anyone's for some reason listening to this new in the wild but we are jt music formerly oh. jt machinima uh we make video game uh raps and spoofs not spoofs but video game songs and all these different things nerd on the core. internet. Yeah, nerdcore music. Genre. Yeah. And I am John or Pat Fan. <laughs> and I am Christian or Skull Cruncher. Yeah. We probably should have started. But yeah. hey, if you're We here, will start every episode like this. I was like, it's too late. It doesn't make sense, but See, gotta gotta build the build the habit somehow. Yeah. Somewhere. We're just such a well oiled podcast machine already that we just dove right into yeah. it. Yeah. I guess um, it, I mean that's maybe the the harm of not the harm, but the the Patreon podcast is what we've been practicing with. And it's always to like an audience that knows who we are Yeah, for sure. And I think most of you do too, 
But uh, rewinding it back to that time of of subscribers, where like twenty thousand was a lot of whatever, like that also was a big deal then because our subscribers turned out, and it's not that they don't turn out today, but it's just there's no algorithm. Like if you had two thousand subscribers, usually probably fifteen hundred people saw your video mm-hmm. within the first week, and then you would hit that two thousand number eventually within a week or two. Like as a whole different, like, and that, that those numbers meant a whole different thing. And this is probably going on, this will be going on the JT TV YouTube channel and as, as well as po- uh, podcasting platforms that you're probably listening to it, mm-hmm. this right now on, but you know, it'll be on that channel as like 200, 200,000 plus subscribers. This will probably get optimistically a thousand views in, in the first few days. So yeah. it's, it, it's come a long way in a not great way. The algorithm is is weird and you know you got the it, notification bell and notifications that you have to turn on yeah it, and, and it's, it's also tough with like youtube is so oversaturated now yeah. and i get that youtube is trying to like you know i think i really do think i they have the best intentions so they obviously want their creators to do well but it is tough where like especially with our type of content like we try to vary it up all the time um with in terms of both our channels, like we try to, we've always tried to vary things up, but YouTube definitely wants you to like find exactly what is working yeah. for and do it well. But we've also seen a lot of like YouTubers, some people in our circle of nerdcore who have kind of pigeonholed themselves into yeah. a specific thing, which we've never tr- wanted to do. And um, you go one so, of two ways: you you still do it and own it and mm-hmm. learn to like it, or you you own it and hate it, or you somewhere in between and you cut your production down severely and make, make enough to stay not relevant, but just make enough to, to kind of have something going on. And, and there's mm-hmm. a lot of people kind of covering all of that with the, the pigeonholing. But I think, mm-hmm. I think we've been fortunate enough where we, but what we're, what we're cornered in is just video games, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think we can branch out here and there with um, kind of goofy stuff like over being over you like that kind of satire or even the movie or the movie and TV show stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but like we've, we've made it a point very early on to be broad with what we make. Mm-hmm. And it's been, we've, it's been, we've been lucky with that. For yeah. sure. Oh, um, and I love it too. Like I, it, it was tempting. Like for example, like in the five nights at Freddy's days, it was tempting to want to just only make five nights at Freddy's songs to get that bag, yeah. secure that bag. But even at the time, like we, we just wanted to do other things and keep it interesting yeah. and mix it up. And I think that's part of why we've been able to do this for so long. Cause dude, it's crazy. We're coming up on like, like we've been years. 13 years. But, We're on year 13. So yeah. yeah. But doing it like as our full-time jobs, we be, we went full-time with it in like 2015, I think. Yeah. Wait, so when we both officially seven, were full time. Seven years. It. Seven years full time job, not just 13 years mm-hmm. of doing it, like seven years of a full time job. And I think I, I'd really like to think that that's partly because we have always kind of kept it, you know, mixing it up and everything. But it can certainly get discouraging when you see you've got like 4 million subscribers, but like a video only gets like 100,000 yeah. views. But then you might have one that gets like. 10 million. It's, yeah. it's strange, especially I mean, with our type of content specifically. Yeah. PewDiePie, strange. he has like a hundred million and he gets 5 million views, which is still a fuckload per upload. Yeah. But it's still very, I mean, then that's, that has its own things with that whole T series build up and how many of those subscribers are real. But the point remains, it would be nice if your subscribers saw the stuff you made. Yeah. And I think a lot of that also has a lot to do with user behavior. I think, you know, I th- it's it's weird. I th- like subscriptions have been, and we see it in the comments are used as a token of like that was good, like mm-hmm. as a like. Uh, it's like you can like it, and then if you really liked it, you can subscribe. And usually that's a, that's a normal um, pattern, but no one follows up. It's just like I like this thing, and so there's a lot of kind of just people who subscribe that don't don't uh, never follow up on more videos, which is fine. Mm-hmm. It just inflates that number. Yeah, and then. And additionally with subscribers, you know, the, uh, God, I had a thought and then I lost it. I have, my memory has been shit lately. 
subscribers. Subscri uh, well, we were talking about how initially how subscribers back in like 2007, 2008 meant yeah. a lot more. Was it something related to that? Yeah, it's like it's one of those things when the, the memory goes and the more I think about it, I can just feel it disappearing in that pit. So then I try to stop thinking about it, but then I, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, all this stuff, and maybe it'll come back to me out of nowhere, but all this kind of build up was me making videos and learning the power of editing, you making stuff with friends and enjoying yeah. the beat and production process. And, and then I had moved and we got the Xbox to stay in touch. So that's the, the kind of where we're at with mm -hmm. the history of JT music or machinima at the time. Mm -hmm. And so you, we were playing Halo and you showed me, you, I don't know, you take over this. I, I, guess. I, th I think I had already started, I had already made like a Halo, a remix of the Halo theme into a, like this little hip hop beat, sent it to John. And I can't remember if you made the montage first or you, you were like, you should make a rap for this and I'll make a music video. I'll make a machinima video. Maybe you had already made the montage with, with just the instrumental. You made the instrumental. We had a fun co-op session. I just recorded stupid gameplay of it. Yeah. Of that, or I went into theater mode and recorded a bunch of like moments. Yeah. And then we just had the beat and this video. Yeah. And then, then I think it evolved to, and then I tr then I made that video I'm talking about that the, the action sequence that I learned the power of editing, mm -hmm. and then I'd, somewhere along that line, I was like, "You should make a song. I'll make the music video." Yep, and I'll upload it to this website called Machinima yeah. that I had never heard of. Um, and speaking of uh, numbers being a lot more uh, impactful back in these yeah. early days of YouTube, I remember uh, after you had uploaded it, I was in uh, like a graphic design class in high school I forget what it was called and I remember I was telling some kids in my class about how we had made this music video and they asked about it to look it up and they were like oh is it this one that has like 50,000 oh, yeah. views and I was just like no that's I didn't even look at the video I just knew <laughs> that's not the right one it definitely doesn't have 50,000 views and he was like are you sure it's the title and everything and I looked and it was and it was on Machinima's YouTube channel had like 50 something thousand views. I remember like just my mind was blown. Yeah, and then you texted me and I didn't, my mind wasn't blown because I didn't believe it. Yeah, no, I had yeah. the exact same reaction. I was like, oh, you just got the wrong video. That I was, was like, like you're, you're stupid. That can't be it. Yeah, <laughs> like, no. You're, you're dumb. You're not telling me the right thing. You looked, you saw the wrong video. Absolutely I didn't believe insane. Them. Um, that was just about the coolest thing um i'm trying to because i vaguely remember that day and like peering over this dude's i think i shoulder. was i was working i was in i was in weight training class when i got those texts i think is where i was that's yeah and I was, I was and then i i don't know if i was able to verify it because that was that was in 2007 or 8 you know that's a different mm -hmm. time in 2008 where you know you didn't have the smartphones and you could act have just see things you know yeah but i think I, I told some of my spot buddies uh, I don't, I thought that's that's my moment i guess just yeah. illustrating that moment benching no it's uh it's really cool because like we were we were talking about like being introverted and like kind oh, of yeah. using this as an outlet yeah. like i know for me and i'm sure for you too like making music and stuff has always been this feeling of like having to prove myself to the world and like oh i'm gonna prove myself through my cre i think a lot of artists and creative people feel like that i'm proving yeah. myself through my my passion or my work so when it actually gets eyes on it that was like it was kind of scary but also yeah. really cool because people loved it yeah. like people thought it was really funny and because the song for those of you who don't know i'm assuming most of you do it's a very goofy song about being the yeah. greatest halo 3 player ever it was like very kind of weird al uh uh john lajoy Bo well Burnham. the opening lines sh word out to my homie g shizzle dogs so that sh yep. that should paint the, the tone for you yeah and uh oh and people loved it i do I do remember the thing I forgot. Sorry for the burp <laughs> to the mic. I do remember the thing I got forgot. And I remember there was a whole, there's a whole thing about three or four years ago when everyone's like, every time I upload, I lose subscribers and like thought this was just conspiracy through YouTube. And like people would share like, Hey, PewDiePie, I'm, su I'm subscribed to you, but look, my button's not pushed or something. Like, I think those were separate things. Like I think YouTube had hit a maturity point where the users hit a maturity point where they had all these subscribers from different times in their life or they've had accounts long enough where their tastes change or whatever. And when a new video gets uploaded, you're like, I'm not interested in that. I don't watch it. And you, you don't, you don't click on it enough. And then like after the, it's like a spam email that you eventually like, fuck it. Okay. I'm going to go and unsubscribe. You know, it's kind of like that where then you, a certain point you, you get, you see the new video come up and that's your prompt to go unsubscribe. And so 
um, that's just another, that was just, that wasn't adding a lot to it, but that was just an observation from someone on the back end of what that, what I think that is. And it's not YouTube being a faulty platform or anything. Yeah. It, it's just, it's burnout. It's churn, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we're back to the day we found out, but also I remember kind of the months leading up to this, I was, oh, I was, I enjoyed the feedback of putting stuff out there and having people see it. I enjoyed the comments. Yeah, it was a you very were already a YouTuber at this point. Yeah, it was a very already. positive, fun experience with the just the kind of variety gaming channel I I had. I guess mm -hmm. you can go back and JTTV this channel and see some of the early stuff. Yeah, I've unlisted right. some J things that truly just weren't right for the channel, <laughs> or just I don't know. They're just, Didn't you, age you, well. You can, you can police yourself. You know, if, yeah. if it's a little cringe for you, you don't you don't have to have it out there over time, but. Um, uh, God, my my trains of thought are so bad today. What was yeah. I just talking about? Talking about the early date, like being a a little YouTuber. Oh like yeah, so I, I, remember, your like, I wanted it. Like I like I was like, this is cool, and then this is. I just wanted to have more audiences. So I remember I was googling videos of like how to get more YouTube video or more YouTube views, and yeah. like these stupid tutorials that would never help you out. And so to have that kind of be realized, and you know, fast forward almost fifteen years later, and it is my job on it and there i've we've found this way to get views i guess mm -hmm. essentially is, is pretty cool it's it's one of those little moments where that that i think that particular to me not the not the like surprise fifty thousand view um text like mm -hmm. that version of me would mm -hmm. probably not if not that i have to pick one version of me to go hypothetically go talk to and say but that would be the one i would be like hey you know you're gonna do it i guess you're gonna do it because that was to me that was a moment I know, and, and not that moment didn't project anything. There wasn't a trajectory from that moment necessarily, as there was for the fifty thousand overnight thing. But it was, I don't know. There I, was some I, payoff I, from yeah. your hard work because even though I tell people this all the time, like you were working hard on like your montage and making your YouTube stuff, yeah. and like that was like just like me for the early days of working on music. I was working. We were grinding, making content but it didn't always feel like work because we were yeah, just, just so fun. passionate and wanted to see those views again yeah. which after we did the first one we were like oh we should make one for call of duty since yep. we did a halo one so we did a, a call of duty one people liked that and that did was a mix of uh because halo, the halo one was machinima and then the call of duty one i tried recreating machinima in the janky way of like lowering the gun and blocking out bars <sighs> And I had no idea about aspect ratio and I didn't keep things consistent. I would That's just, right, cause I would, it would be so inconsistent. Like one gun has a higher profile in the first person view. So the, the bar would be up more. And so stuff was just all janked. And there was like this one effect where the, oh, you'll be dead. So I made the screen blood like in GoldenEye or like video game, kind of that red effect when you go dead. Mm. And it, the ratio is fucked. So it like barely covers half of the frame. It's and, so good. It's so good. And uh, oh, but the Call of Duty one was probably the big, the big one that changed everything. Not necessarily because it was, I would say the greatest ever. Is not, it's more, more timeless and better and just more nostalgic. But the Call of Duty one is where everything set off because we also uploaded to Machinima, and we got recognized. Yes, and by. also context. Machinima at the day was a video platform. This was before YouTube was king. There was different destinations to go see videos. Mm -hmm. And Machinima used to be a gaming Machinima, primarily Machinima um, channel. So that's why I would go up there so people could see our Machinima. Yep. And they also had a YouTube channel and there's some fine print where if you upload, then they can upload it to their cha their YouTube channel that had a bigger audience. Which we didn't care because we were getting those views. Yeah. Like those we weren't seeing a dime about it, but we're, we're dime from it, but it was still just Back then, that, you, it's so easy to take advantage of the yeah. 16, 17 I mean, year old kids. And like, they did. Always, uh, always, fast forward a few years, they did. Yeah. But. Oh, they did. Yeah. But at the time, just seeing a million views on a video that you, I, it's like, I don't care. That I'm getting eyes on it. That's yeah. amazing. That's, that's, um, it's easy to lose perspective on that. I think one thing I always like to say is when I'm at a sports game or an arena, but be it there's 20,000 or 60, whatever kind of arena it is, 60,000 people, you look around and it's like, this is 60,000 people. Yeah. Like 60,000 like, views is, a lot. is not insignificant or 20,000, like seeing 20,000 people and that being put into perspective. Oh yeah. Not insignificant. It's so um, easy to see that little digit on, on a computer screen and computer screen and kind of write it off as like, yeah. Oh, that, but like, yeah, no seeing it. It's like, Whoa, that's a lot of eyes. Yeah. It's cool. Um, yep. and yeah. And so they, they emailed us and just said, Hey, You've been making, you've made these two videos. We noticed it. 
you want to keep making them and we'll pay you. And, and I mean, I got this email, 16 year old kid sent it to Christian, like cool. And then like showed the, our parents like, Hey, this is a thing. And you know, they're obviously pest, not pet, uh, cautionary, you know, skeptical, skeptical yeah. is the word. Yeah. And, but didn't, there was never any doubt. Like there was never any doubt that they would let us do it, I guess. Mm. And you know, they, they encouraged it and, you know, had us be, do our due diligence the best we could as 16 year old kids, but everything checked out. And, you know, we signed that, that contract to just upload videos and they would pay us out, I think quarterly. Yeah. And I don't even remember. Cause it ended up becoming a flat rate pay, but it wasn't. Yeah. That was first. way later. Yeah. And I, I think oh. it was like a $2 50 cent CPM. And I think that was at a time like it was, if that was a fixed rate, the CPM was a fixed rate, which I think worked in our benefit during the slow seasons, but during the, the holidays, you know, they're making like gangbusters with her, with her uh, ad rep. But that's, that was before way before that. But, mm-hmm. um, and then at the same time, uh, Treyarch actually hit us up and said, we saw this video and it was dope. And they sent us each uh, a care package of like these kind of like Nazi zombies, playing cards, playing cards, t-shirts, and then magazine covers from like game informer when yeah. world at war came out and, and that was each, signed by the team. Yeah. They gave us two copies. Each one was signed. And, and uh, so mine's that, mine's in my office. I don't know where mine, the cards are and I still have the t-shirt kind of, I don't wear it, but I have it. Yeah, me away. too. I still have the t-shirt. My, uh, the magazine cover is somewhere stashed away back at my house up in Maine. But, um, yeah, that was so cool. The second, like, real project we had ever made yeah like made not waves um, but like it, it it impacted the right people to encourage us even more and yeah. I, I don't think we needed it but i was like okay well let's do it mm-hmm. and so also, i feel like i gotta emphasize again even though it was our second like project as jt we have had years of like creating stuff together and like i was saying we were both kind of finding our creative paths on our own before we came together as jt machinima at yeah. the time like i was starting to make music you were already making stuff on youtube so mm-hmm. you already knew about the machinima space and all that stuff so it wasn't like we just totally got lucky there yeah. was a little luck in there but also we were we were already starting to hone our craft and yeah. we didn't even really know it well, i think i think there's the the things that lead to success you know, is just working hard and then good luck comes from that. Yeah. And that's not to simplify or downplay anything that anyone does for, through hard work, but I think you work hard and it just creates a multiplier of good opportunities. Yeah. And then you add the multiplier of being not early adopters, but being on this platform early. Mm. And so there's a lot of things that stacked in our benefit, you yeah, know, for sure. And that, that, that was huge. And we had that, we had all these things stacked in our benefit and we could have gone one of two ways and we didn't have the foresight and not a lot of people probably did at that time but to just do our own thing, you know, and build that and know that we could build our own audience because people are coming out. But no, we thought people are watching this because it's in a place where there's an audience. It, it's Machinima's got way more subs yeah. than we'll ever dream of exactly. having. So we pretty much kind of were under that side of things for, I don't know, four to five years. A long time. And we were able to... to you know, pull a healthy side hustle cash, each like kind of amount of revenue out of that. Eat. Like it wasn't life changing, but it was enough to kind of, I don't know, just ha- have, have some money as like high school kids and then go into college and help have some money for things. And you know, yeah. in that, in that setting and you know, but I remember the first paycheck that we got from Machinimo, I think was like $600 for like a quarter. That was the first one. Wow. It was like 672 or something like that. And it was like a, it was a, it was, they mailed us a check and it had the machinima letterhead, which is kind of cool. And I still have that somewhere. Damn. And then, That's you know, incredible. I, I deposited and sent you half, I think directly yeah. for me. Um, Dude, and that, then I bought a PS, I think I bought a PS3 with it. Nice. Just, I, re- I remember very being financially with, wise decisions with a, with a paycheck. Yeah. Blow it all at once. But oh wait, I think I was with you when you yeah, bought you that. Visited yeah, that time. that's right. I visited yeah. and yeah, that's right. And then I remember we, we ended up like the money just exponentially rose. Like we ended up getting like, it was like a 4,000, like three or 4,000 yep. one. And it, I remember it was when I was in college, it literally like paid my tuition that, yeah. that semester. Like and then we it had was, music sales too. Yep. So as we were able to, I mean, at the time, no one could live off of it, but as students, it was, it was, 
it was nice. Ins- I guess it was insane, especially yeah. because this was we never went into this hoping to m- make a business or yeah. or have an office someday. It was like just totally let's get some views, let's put our content out on YouTube. So the, even even if Machinima, not saying they were ripping us off at that time, but even if they were, we didn't give a shit. Getting yeah. those paychecks is it, just it, like students was like Dude. it didn't hand, the 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 path we took. It didn't handicap us yeah. as as a general thing. It's just. I think there was a path with untapped potential at the time that we of didn't course. take. Yeah. Um, but but the Machinima times were, were pretty good. We had some good contacts there. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, there was, I think we had about two or three. There was a lot of turnover in that company, but there's two or three that were pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then the company itself started going south, and you could tell by the kind of people that were account managers. And and it just it just kept going downhill. And then at the same time, or because of that, they were they kept denying our videos, and the the, the coinage was not of brand interest. Oh, I and it was like those words. These were this song, like this content has been successful on this channel for years, yep. and not a brand interest. And they then, wanted us to do parodies. They didn't yeah. want original and that music. Was Machinima trying to be a all things, an all things entertainment platform for for men ages eighteen to thirty five. So it was everything. Machinima just became a destination for everything, like NASCAR, WWE, video games, movies, tele, like everything. And yeah. they hit probably hit everything besides hunting, and <laughs> and so when our border, like I think our Borderlands uh, two rap was of not a brand interest we're like okay and we upload our own channel and that started to kind of dwindle away the the machinima times and mm-hmm. and then we did a like a five video contract with realms or machinima 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 respawn respawn yeah and uh then we just made five kind of multiplayer thing games like titanfall and call of duty stuff like that yeah and then that was it and we were so lucky because that was the time when mcns were blowing up and Machinima was pulling in the director's pro because it was called the director's program. They would Machinima was just pulling in all these creators who were making Machinima. And so there was a golden age of Machinima, the YouTube channel, and Machinima the the uh the medium where people were just creating all sorts of awesome things like Dark Spire Films, um, John CJG, uh anything from like any of the creature people, like from the creatures and crowd chop, they were all machinima people creating all their stuff. Um and I'm blanking on like a lot of people, but I don't know, even like the, the, the bullshit, uh, Gmod idiot box, like that still happens today. But that was like, like all those things were happening at that time. Uh, I mean us even, I'll throw us up in there a little bit with the music videos, the yeah, halo videos sure. particularly. Mm-hmm. And, and then the Minecraft ones, I'd even say lump in there mm-hmm. and that was the golden age. And then it just, it just went away when they did the not a brand interest stuff and just grew this company into an all men or all things entertainment for 18 to 35 year old year old aged men yeah it's it's really interesting listening there's so many podcasts out there now talking about machinima's decline and stuff and we only experienced it from the tip of the iceberg from our contact with machinima and and trying to get our videos on machinima so it's really interesting to see the parallels of our declining relationship with machinima as that stuff was happening and a lot of our suspicions were true just like yeah, they still owe poor us management, two thousand dollars. I think from the, the yep. I think from four of the respawn videos. I think we only got paid for one. We're still waiting, Machinima. Yeah, I mean, it's not Hit gonna. Us up. I mean, Rooster Teeth, Warner Bros. Rooster, like they all have Machinima stuff. We're not gonna see that money. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but it just but speaks kind of, to yeah. you know. But that goes to the the um like the like the MCN stuff with Machinima. Like they had this director's program. And so there were, everyone were growing MCNs at this time, a multi-channel network. And it's essentially someone that has your videos and sells all your, like your videos to like to not your videos, but ad space. And they pull on all these contacts and then your video has ads. And then, and then Google takes a cut, the MCN takes a cut and then you get a cut. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they were signing everyone on. And for some reason we didn't, we didn't get signed. And we would have if they offered it to us because we didn't know. Mm-hmm. And there are so many channels that got stuck in these renewing contracts and just got their channels were like their personal channels were in the network. So yeah. it's not even like them uploading to Machinima. It's just their their own thing was now tied to that network and a renewing auto renewing contract. Which was and so the most people fucked. yeah it's so fucked. And, and the pe- splits were like most MCN splits are like. At the worst, like 70, 30, some of them are 80, 20. You should be at like, you know, 90, 10, if MCNs even exist anymore. But um, 
No, so Machinima, I've heard that some people were in 60 40 yeah, contracts that were auto renewing. Absolutely insane. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so it was, a lot of, it was a lot of kids. You know, it was, yeah. I would say 13 to 25 year olds. Yeah. And, and no, this was such a new realm. And no one understood what, the, no one knew the value of what they were doing. You know, it was just money and this, any money was good because I'm doing this and I'm having fun. It was a total exploitation of a whole, you know, generation of creators. Yeah. And we escaped that just out of pure luck. Cause again, yeah. we would have signed on. Honestly, it's like a little butt hurt. They never asked us to sign on, but it's <laughs> like clearly a good, a, yep. a blessing. Yeah. Um, yeah. If there's a takeaway, if you're a business owner out there, just know that uh teenage t- creative teenagers, just take advantage of them, milk them for all they're worth. And then <laughs> I mean, throw them it's out. happening That's, today. Oh uh, yeah. All the, it, all the I'm animators sure and will. artists that people, using content are severely underpaid yeah and it's because they don't know their worth um or their talent and you know i think the only thing missing for a lot of them is communication and reliability and like they're 15 years and years old or 18 or whatever in high school like and you're not paying them well so it's like whatever but if, if someone were to show that they could be a reliable person that we aren't overworking to you got to make sure that's balanced and yeah, you know, you got to give them what they're worth. Yeah, and that's because it, it's so tough knowing your worth at that age. Yeah, I feel like it's either well, actually, this is true of everyone. <laughs> yeah. it's either you don't you don't know your worth, or you think you're the hottest shit yeah. on earth. Which which one is worse? I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, it's it, yeah, Machinima definitely did some naughty things back in the day. Yep. But uh, yes. hey, it was a learn. It was a stepping stone, and ultimately, nothing like catastrophically bad yeah. happened it ended up being a blessing like we yeah. were getting to like we ended up uploading slowly more and more to our own channel and uh that as soon as we really started consistently doing yeah. that especially when we really started to grind and do like a song a music video every week mm-hmm. with the growth just happened and it was like I, I remember us saying at the time like damn we should have done this years ago yeah i think we we would make things around releases so obviously we were we never like a schedule per se with machinima or even the very post machinima time it was just kind of what is made is made but then eventually moved to a kind of a list format where we were making things as as fast as we could at a reasonable rate and just kept knocking off the one at the top of the list and it'd be uploaded when it was uploaded and then we switched to a schedule when our mcn that we did sign on to broadband tv mm-hmm. recommended that and so we did that and I mean, that paved the way and set a precedent that, you know, helped people grow, but also (laughs) helped a lot of people reach burnout. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, I I think it's a conclusion people would have come to eventually is, is, is scheduled content. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 it's a hard, it's hard to recommend it. I recommend it. If you want to grow, you got to hustle period. If you want to grow and that is a blueprint, there's other ways. um, But that's, that's one of the ways. And so. Because you have some YouTubers out there who can just like upload out of the blue and people are just itching. Yeah, like for Video them. Game Donkey or something like that. Yeah, something like or, that. Yeah. But those people, you know, every obviously every channel is different, but some of those people just have the X factor. But I'm sure yep. even you could probably go back and look at most of those people. They had a grind period, they had a period where they were just like, the hustle has to be real. But like yeah. I said earlier, if you love what you're doing, the, the hustle doesn't, it's so cliche to say, but if you love your job, it doesn't feel like a job. Yeah. Um, we never, so nothing was ever geared for, for money or for a lifestyle necessarily. Yeah. It was always just doing it cause we loved it mm-hmm. and the money was nice. Yeah. And then, and then it just grew to a point to be a job to make mm-hmm. a living off of it. And we just wanted to grow, you know, it wasn't motivated towards hitting a target or a lifestyle again it was it was just i don't know be comfortable and yeah. i i'd almost say and i'm using lifestyle a lot but we've transitioned more into a lifestyle kind of stage because there's hustle 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 and we've hit a point where we want to continue to grow mm-hmm. but we're we're working at a lifestyle pace where we can lo- live our life and enjoy our life and enjoy our work. Sustainability. Yeah. Yes. That is absolutely the name of the game. Also, it's just like in our early twenties and stuff that that's when yeah, hustling, that's when you have it, that's you, when you it's got easy. it. If you're not hustling in your twenties. Yeah. And I, I say this, I don't want to be Gary V. <laughs> don't toxic. be Gary V. I don't want to <laughs> be Gary V. Toxic, but like that's when you can do it with a li- like there's less consequence uh, physically for sure to yeah. hustle then mm-hmm. emotionally and psychologically i don't know where if it's easier or not but like you have the you definitely have the energy in your 20s and 
you know, you, you should take advantage of it. I yeah. don't like that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a life advice from a 30 year old, I guess. I don't yeah, know. no, I mean, it's weird. Even though I don't really feel that we're both in our thirties now. Yeah. It's weird to say, but like, I don't really feel like my age doesn't bother me, Yeah. but it was like hitting 30 is like, you just, you kind of get a little more jaded with life, but you also have more life experience, obviously, because you're older, you're out of yeah. your twenties. It's like this weird, like, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but yeah. and that's um, not to say you can't hustle whenever. I'm just saying in the twenties, it's and maybe I could hustle hard if I career shifted, you know, mm -hmm. but within the same thing, it's hard to, it's hard to want to hustle at this point. And mm -hmm. it's not that, and I don't want to, you know, I'm happy where we're at with, yeah. with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, but we just kept uploading to the main channel. We switched over to more kind of regular scheduled content and that worked out and that a lot allowed us to find new topics because before we we're just doing things of interest to us and we shifted not it was still things that are of interest to us but we were looking for things because we only can like and play so many video games mm -hmm. so that's like what else is there you know and so then you have like F fnaf pull got pulled in essentially or all those indie games through that time came in our radar mm -hmm. because they were new and interesting and also were performing well yep. but the performing well only mattered or only it got us on the radar, but then it made us, we looked into it and we liked it. Mm -hmm. So I think we've only ever done one song, maybe two, that was purely like, I think this will do good yeah. because it's a popular thing. And that was World of Warcraft, which League. was just probably 10 years too late, honestly. But I do, I do, do enjoy that song. So it has, the beat a, was has, a, has a sick beat that like kind of <laughs> that saxophony thing. Yeah. The, I'm remembering the sound and the, the kind of, the beat, I like the beat a lot. Yeah, the beat um, was pretty sick now that I think back to yeah. it. And then we did a League of Legends song, both of which, which it's weirdly validating seeing both of those at the time not do that well. Even though I didn't really feel this way at the time, looking back, it's like it can be validating when something that you're not passionate about doesn't do well. Because like John kind of touched on, when, when FNAF came out, we didn't just make FNAF songs to like, get a lot of views like we joke about being exhausted of FNAF now like everybody does but when it first came out that game was so cool and we loved it like we thought it was really it's, again going back to our Chuck E. Cheese days making these animatronics evil everybody's like it was such a cool idea yeah. for a game so there was passion involved in it too yeah. like I always tell people that like our, our videos that have blown up I, I think there's a perfect mix of like good video, catchy song, good timing, popular. Like it's always a perfect mix of all those things and passion too. And that's totally true for FNAF. Yeah. So seeing those projects that were like, oh, we tried to do League of Legends because it's popular, but there was no heart in it. Like I just, you know, it, it's yeah. kind of validating like, oh, you know, do what you love. And it, you know. I think the, the simplifying terms here, but you guys know what I mean when I say these terms, like the gamer, but the nerd audience, geeks, whatever you want to say, are really good at snuffing out bullshit. Yes, and so, 100%. I mean, that's that's all that's play there. And and that's where the passion comes through because the passion fuels, I guess, knowledge and and, and just the understanding of the, the medium, you know? Yeah. And I think an example of one that we did that wasn't, I mean, I played the game and I enjoyed it, but it was World of Tanks. But we worked with the community manager to find out what people loved and what drove that community. Oh, yeah. And that, that worked out, and yeah, and that worked out really well. So that was um, fueled by me being into it, Christian being game to look into it, and that's working with community manager who was very passionate and communicated very clearly those pat like the community's passions, his passions, and just the the game. Yeah, and that that worked out really well. That, that was, was really that's a cool. weird that's a that's a weird. Like we do think like we have our, we have the checklist of why we, of songs we do, and that World of Tanks one's kind of over here. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I forget about that song, but it was pretty cool song, pretty cool beat. Speaking from my end on the music end, obviously, and I remember there were a couple funny like community jokes yeah. that were interjected into there. Because even though I didn't play the game, I thought it was well, it was really cool that we were co talking to the community yeah. manager, but also like basically working with this guy to make the song. Um, and I remember we met him or somebody else from we met World him. of Tanks. Yeah, we met him at a World of Tanks booth. And he was PAX like starstruck East. to meet us. Yeah. It was so cool. Um, so that was neat. That was really cool. Like basically kind of working with a game to yeah, make this Yeah, it was one of our first times song. working directly with them. And so kind of split off, do our own thing. Next, Machine was in the back mirror. We're grinding, we're grinding. We had... 100,000 subscribers around the six year overall mark. Yep. All the way back from greatest ever. And so that's, 
a significant thing because that's that kind of like I think we hit a million three years later mm-hmm. or not even maybe two years later. Yeah. And so that that just serves to like it's not an overnight success. I'm not saying that um, so you can sympathize with me. I, I just more of the realization that it's it's not easy. And mm-hmm. that's the biggest thing. People always ask for tips. And it's like there's no information I can give you that's going to give you what you want because you want you want to you want this thing to blow up for yourself and it's working hard for six years and something hits and mm. then ten, two things hit and then it can kind of snowball and yeah that that was a big deal when we hit a hundred thousand I think to me that was I think I even said in the documentary like that that plaque that moment felt more felt more more like earned. you climb to the top of the mountain and you're like ah oh, you're super satisfied oh yeah dude that if, felt better than the than a million yeah, honestly if we had to choose to get rid of one of the plaques for whatever reason somebody comes in with a gun they're gonna yeah. shoot one of our plaques i would say <laughs> the million one because the hundred thousand one felt like so much more like work and effort and yeah. i'm just like it, it is so hard because I, I really think it's like a mental trick. When people see that you have six digits in your subscriber yep. number, they think you're legit. So hitting that 100,000 is so much harder. I don't know if every content creator has that similar milestone. And it milestone. could change now because I feel like new channels that make good content are favored in the algorithm. But this was before that, I think, mm. um, to toot around horns, I guess. Yeah. With conjecture. <laughs> um, anyway, so we were kind of working as like – dungeon trolls for a while yeah each in our own respective area Mm -hmm. um me and in north carolina my my dorm my college apartment stuff like that you and your college dorm and then back up in maine Mm -hmm. and then eventually you you move down to about an hour and a half yep away down with my girlfriend at the time she was going to grad school it just worked out and then we could continue working on our stuff even though it was still like a a part-time gig for us for the first time and Five, no, I guess it'd be three plus. So first time in seven years, you Eight. know, we were w- close. It was an hour and a half, but we were close together, mm-hmm. relatively speaking. Yeah. You know, better than a, in a flight or a 18 hour drive. So that was a huge kind of boost to like that grind, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know. No, because so, then within like two years of that period we were able to like we finally reached a point where we were like oh we can go full-time with this um and it was it wasn't like even though there's an inherent risk with becoming self-employed it wasn't like a huge like we we reached a point where it was like okay we think especially john who's the business mind of this operation was like okay i think this is at a point where we can do this yeah and like we we got we got our cpa set up like immediately yeah and got got incorporated kind of so like after I graduated, I worked at the marketing agency that mm. was essentially a startup. And that startup was about six months ahead of where JT was in terms of doing all the stuff that needed to be done, you know, incorporating CPAs, um, uh, payroll, quick, like tax, like, uh, oh, what's the word? Just doing the books. I'm, I'm blanking on the word. Yeah. And stuff so, that you don't, words, buzzwords that you don't want to be hearing if you're a creative yeah. artsy fart like me. Uh, but are very, very important. Yeah, like, so I had the <laughs> I had the road the road the road map I had the road map ahead of me thanks to being in this this marketing thing, this marketing job. And eventually JT kept growing and growing and the money was just kind of, well, got even ish, I guess. And then I had a talk with them and I went part time and that was awesome. That was like a that was like that was just awesome to have two and a half days a week to like that I could dedicate to JT mm-hmm. during the day. Cause I would, I was essentially working two jobs, but this was a breath of fresh air and just like, I can live in, I can live in it. Like, I'm, I don't know, like this is my living now, I guess it always yeah. was, but it just was a mental shift. Yeah. And then, um, we went to PAX East and which was also our first time just getting in. Cause we were, I, I, I joked about us being dungeon trolls. That was our first time getting out and being in the industry and meeting people. We met our first fan, Ethan, Ethan, Ethan dude. Yep. I'll never forget him in the, the bridge overpass thing in the convention yep. center at, in Boston come. He was the first, fi- well, not the first fan to recognize us. I, I had been recognized like once before, but the first fan to ask for an autograph and to like, you were going to say like putting faces to fans and like getting out there meeting game developers. Yeah. And like it, it put it's a huge. whole new spin on 
that what we're doing is pretty legit now. Like we're talking to industry people and meeting yeah. fans like holy schnazberries. Yeah, and so then after I went back to that marketing job and I remember we're having like a meeting and they would kind of pull you in for some projects mm. and we had a meeting with one of the bosses and they were talking about the marketing convention inbound, which was also in Boston. And they were like, oh, talking about how sick it was. <laughs> and so it's kind of rude. And, but she was like, yeah, it's really sick, Christian. Like you can come with the team next time. Right, John? I'm like, it's really cool. I'm like, honestly, after going to PAX East, like those are my people. That's, that was so cool. Like I can't, I can't I have to be honest. I can't, I can't say it's that cool because yeah. Christian was there too. And he's yeah. going to go to this marketing convention and it's, and I remember, I, I, I remember, I don't remember that as well, but I do remember you like when we weren't there being like, yeah, you shouldn't go. Like, I'm pretty sure you were just like trying to save me. Yeah. Like, don't, it's so boring. And I, I, like, I, well, I, I, I like it. There's a value there, but like, I, like Aziz Ansari and Amy Schumer did stand up at the, at the show. Like they pull in legit people to entertain yeah. the guests. So it's, but compared to PAX East for us gamers, yeah. dude, it's the moment to moment and being with your people, I think yeah. was, was what was so awakening. Yeah. For for PAX at that time, and and so after after that moment, I shortly left that company and, and went full time with JT. After yeah. that epiphany of PAX East 2016, yeah, that was a that was a big thing. And then kind of rewind. So, so he was an hour and a half away. That's um a year or mm, two or three years later, moved to Wilmington, and we're in the same town. Yep, and have been in the same town since that point. I don't know if it's 2015, 16? Yeah, 2015. That's yeah. when. Yeah, because I, I was working before. I was working part time at a news station a couple hours away. Ended up moving to Wilmington. And, like, man, I remember just oh, moving into those apartments. I guess it doesn't matter if I say. I was going to say. Yeah, it doesn't I mean, one matter. Midtown. One Midtown apartments in Wilmington. I love those apartments. Yeah, and that was, was a good. Like, oh, Disp- and just. Yeah. Like, Despite being in the relationship I was at the time, that was still like a good time in my life. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 20, 2016, and 17 were good 2017 years. 2017 were really good years. Like, especially just purely based on, I mean, the vibe was great. Everything, life was good. We're but in the like, same building, apartment building. Yeah. Like, that's how close we were. Yep. So that was really cool. And before that, I was like three minutes down the street. Yeah. I, just, I had to leave that other place because of black mold. But yeah. it was a good, it was a happy accident because then we got to move into a, better place Better, right yeah. next to right next to him yeah oh and that place had such a nice nice pool oh i know yeah that, a nice pool and grill area with a big tv yeah good stuff but good yeah spot. it was just life was good we were like still pretty fresh on going full time with this yep. and like we were definitely in grind mode we were making a lot of music that was 2016 had like that was like the banger year for jt music because i think it was Sands and Papyrus, join us for a bite, and Cuphead. I think all. No, that was 2017. Because oh, we're, we're on year five of all those projects. So oh, all those okay. projects are five years this year. Yeah. Oh, never mind. Including join us for a bite. Yeah. 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 Then 2017 was the banger year. But I think 2016 was even better. I remember we hit 500,000 subscribers that summer. We did the hundred, every every hundred thousand subscriber or every hundred thousand milestone. We did a fun video. Yep. And giveaway. I remember yep. that. That's right. That was fun. And then. Uh, yeah, then 2017 was the banger year. That was also the year that we got to meet Andrea Storm Caden in oh, person, yeah. which was really cool. Or maybe with 20, because we had the office at that time. Yeah, but I think she, oh, maybe, did she come in 2018? Maybe it was. Uh, there's videos that know. probably timestamp it on the internet. Yeah, but no, um, oh, because we got, yeah, because we got the office in early 2017 in Wilmington, and then she yeah. ended up coming that summer. Yeah, which so cool. kind of moved, moved same city live close and we mm. kind of we did a bunch of gaming videos and kind of started having fun with that we started our first podcast gamefinity with with josh who was was my boss at the marketing agency r.i.p to the podcast not to josh <laughs> <laughs> and we uh we hit 30 episodes and it was fun and that was kind of the first foray into podcasting so that's kind of like a direct lineage to this moment of this podcast yeah and that podcast was huge that podcast had like 10 million monthly <laughs> listeners <laughs> it did pretty good it did pretty good we like again hustle time where we hustled and had it we did all the kind of hacky things yeah like life hacky things again and like the the suggestion on you on um itunes and it got like featured on the front page for gaming topics and so like oh. we did the right things and and it got it had had it did. had a good um following yeah and then yeah, then we got the office. It was, I remember, it just felt like a natural move. And I think it was paired with us joining Rooster Teeth. And I was like, okay, mm. let's have a destination. 
you know, it's, we want to work with, we want to collab with these people and collab with other people and having them come to our house is a little, little weird. You know, it, it, that was like the, that was where the concept of a personal space and a workspace kind of got introduced for me. I was like, you know, I, I kind of want my home to be my home. And, and so we were looking around for offices and we looked at houses, like houses to rent that we oh, would then yeah. fit as out, outfit as a, um, as an office, which would still be very viable and cool, especially in a college town. Mm. There's definitely these weird, there's weird college town hou- houses that these guys shoot up on a, on, on a plot of their land, you know, in the subdivide. And they worked, they would have worked really well. Mm-hmm. Um, but we looked at, looked at one office and it was the most expensive option, but it just felt right. Um, it looked nice. It was in a great location, downtown Wilmington. Yeah, it was, it was downtown like, and close to the parking garage. Yeah. Such and, a flex when friends and family would come and visit. Yeah. Be like, damn. And at, at the time, very convenient being on top of a bar. Mm-hmm. It was a great venue for hanging out after a day or whatever, but it was also a great venue for events and stuff. Mm-hmm. And we, we knew the bar. We knew the owners of the bar. Um, oh, yeah. And I mean, that's what interested us to D&D actually was the relationship through that bar. Yeah. But um. I mean, it was just a good setup. It was, it's an awesome spot. I think, I think we, you, you couldn't beat the spot. It was really good. And yeah. the, the price was amazing. And even as the rent went up each year, um, it didn't matter. It was such a good spot. We like, it was the most expensive option that we looked at, but it was the, it was by and far a great value. It was like almost 2000 square feet, second story, historic downtown above a bar. Like it, you just can't beat that. And we, it was, it was great. Yeah. And, and, uh, also just that separation of yeah. work and which is most important, <laughs> like home, which is still hard to do when you're like, when, when, you know, when it's your baby, when it's yeah. your YouTube channel or whatever, if you have it was a, a, it's a paradigm career. shift in your life Yeah, and, and thing like I was, it was like, Oh man, like if I want to do something, I can't just go to my computer across the hall. You know, I have yeah. to. I just can't do it or I have to go drive out. And mm-hmm. you know, that was scary for some reason, but it's, it was healthy. It's a healthy. Yeah. yeah. It's a, yeah, for sure. And, um, and, that, and that made me able to convert my kind of off home office into just a fun room to be in. Mm. And it's, it's nice to shift things up and, and the change of scenery. And I, there's a lot of people who work from home and, and they love it. Um, but I do think it, it can have its, its negative side effects. I know it's not an opportunity for everyone, mm-hmm. but you know, I, I, if, if it isn't, you sh- there should be, you should fake a commute. You should go drive 10 minutes, you know, separate yourself at the end of the day or go for a walk. Cause yep. I think separating work from home is so big. Cause if you don't, your day can blend together oh, and you're yeah. not you need, like, you need to shut off. And something new that I've been doing is shutting off on the weekend, unless it's like very urgent. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, I favor it and build up a bank, build up my to-do list. And then I have like the most productive Monday ever and my weekend I can enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's been nice. It's, it's been a, that's a whole thing we can get into in a whole other episode is kind of like just mental health and generally oh, yeah, work we'll definitely or, and go all into that. that. Yeah. But like, that's, that's the real advice. I can't give you advice on how to grow your channel. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know best practices and stuff obviously, but it's just like, that's the best stuff is the little things, the little quality of life stuff yeah. that you can learn. And this isn't unique to me in this or him and this YouTube thing. This is anyone that works any, any job. career. It's so important. You don't even, especially with burnout, cause I definitely have experience in that arena. You don't even, it's creepy because you don't even realize when you're burning out sometimes, at least in my experience, yeah. sometimes you don't cause, cause when like when views are good, when views are good and money is good, you, you don't realize how tired you are. Same with yeah. like, I mean, you could equate that to like working out. If you're getting a good workout, you might not realize you're fucking up your lower back. What's <laughs> going on with your lumbar? You just popped a disc. You don't even realize it till after. So doing all the things you're talking about is so important. Like having a healthy work home life relationship and yeah, it's stuff we'll definitely go into details on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, especially so the, being self-employed doing yeah. YouTube content creation for a living. The office was a, was a fun thing. It was a great thing. Yeah. Um, and then along that time or what kind of spurned that was the rooster teeth thing. Mm-hmm. And I remember I, I was trying to, f- so we were bribe and TV and they were largely very good in hindsight, really good. Um, it, it, they were a good company to be with they were um as, as far as mcn and then but we wanted something more boutique i feel like we all like we offered something unique and at, pa- at that pax east 2016 there was a rooster teeth panel 
and Jeff said, yeah, they're starting this let's play family. And like, they want to be the Louisville slugger of, of gaming. Like the, the thing you think of when you think of gaming and they were building this kind of collection of, of channels and they were, they already had fun house and achievement hunter and all these things. I think they just got the creatures and kind of funny. Um, and cow chop was new. And I was like, I want to be a part of that because I like all those brands and I, I admired their ability to kind of be responsible adults and do creative content and make that, make those the two pillars that make them successful. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of stuff I aspired to and reached out to Rooster Teeth. And then we, it was like a nine month kind of sales process of each other. And we joined Rooster Teeth as essentially just a glorified MCN boutique. Mm -hmm. The Let's Play stuff never panned out. We did our, we did, we tried. Yeah. I think we tried more than others to kind of make it a thing with, with the people who are working there. Yeah. But that just kind of was whatever, but it, it's largely been a good experience mm -hmm. with Rooster Teeth. We've modified the partnership and stuff as it's made sense. And it's really there. Our crisis hotline for YouTube is all it comes down to now. Mm -hmm. Like there's no merch. They don't sell ads for us, which is not on them. Really. It's hard to sell ads for our kind of content. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they, they pay for our trips whenever we do go out there and pay for our TX and hotel and, and all that. Yeah. But that's, that's the relationship. And then, you know, when there's a weird strike, like we get like a, uh, get a strike for hate speech because we made a song about killing Nazis. Um, you <laughs> know, they, they, they step in and fix that. Yeah. And, and that's, that's worth the partnership for us. And then, you know, here we are, uh, life events and then a move later. Mm -hmm. And we're in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we have a office that doesn't have, doesn't have character, but it's functionally a better office. And we've built this studio. And so that's, that's awesome. And then, yeah. And oh, this, our last yeah. office, I know we were pumping that thing up, but this office is so oh, much, yeah. that I love this office so much more. No cockroaches. Yeah. So Wilmington no ceilings, obviously not a Wilmington anymore, but, and I love Wilmington. I went to college there. I, some of my biggest years of growth as a person were there um through my whole 20s but it it is wet it is yep. moist and it is not kind to anything and in the four year three and a half four years we were in that office the degradation of the hurricanes and just the harsh wetness and the fact that it was a building that was built in 1913 like it was falling apart um there was just cockroaches what happens anywhere in wilmington it's just wet it's a yeah. swamp and you know it was just it was not nice in there anymore <laughs> yeah and anything with old brick buildings like the brick like dust is such an so fucking annoying yeah and like add such a like crusty feeling to a place but like your brother has that in his apartment yeah and it's like they like glossed it with some kind of finish to like stop that but it's it, like the the, the, the brick dust, dust still happens it and just it's like it's yeah yeah and that's it, I don't, not it's such a little thing but it feels so gross yeah no, anyway, I so we had that. that, we had the moisture, we had the, the cockroaches, um, the lights were dying out, Yeah, <laughs> which was but, more on me just not like not knowing how slash wanting to look up a video on how to replace, uh, those, fluorescent lights and yeah, those, but, but it just was starting to add up. I was like, oh man, it's kind of depressing. And so obviously moved out and, and now we're here in this and this is a nice we bought this. And, yeah, and I was going to say we own this too, which is really cool. Yeah, um, and we we bought two two units and and then our our uh our neighbors are really good uh le people. lessees. What's the word? Le lessees. Tenants. They're tenants. really good tenants. They are tenants, yeah, yeah. even though it's not an apartment. And so. so it's it's uh it's just been a really cool move. I don't know. It's it's nice not being in a swamp. And it's nice being in a place, frankly, is more diverse than Wilmington. Mm -hmm. uh, more things to do. It's it, Wilmington's a great place, but I think it was a it was a good move mentally. Yeah, oh, I love I love this city so much. It's uh, it's the perfect size too. We're both small town chaps. I yeah. I don't think either one of us would have ever ever like loved living in a big city. Yeah. Like I, I get overwhelmed just going and visiting a big city. I'm like, my sensory defensiveness really kicks in. You're going to love Chicago. Um, oh yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But you know, uh, well, that's so, why I love Raleigh. And along the way we've done, we've done the, the nerd core show NPC with rocket gaming. So that's coming up. Mm -hmm. So that'll, that'll probably be a whole episode in itself is us talking about NPC and that show and breaking down. Yeah all the good things that happen and hopefully no bad things. Mm -hmm. Um, so that'll be fun. It'll be fun to, we'll probably be doing this at a, at a weekly slate, but we're going to 
be recording probably five episodes so we before we drop. even upload this one. So it'll be, there won't be super current of any eventy, but that will be something we probably will pull up is like, Oh, look at this. We'll have laptops and yeah. React then to things we'll, that are happening. Then we'll but, actually get into getting political. Just kidding. We're yeah. trying to, well, we, we, we might get a little pol- political, but yeah. we won't like, I don't know. We'll see. We're going to talk. I like talking about pop culture stuff yeah. and what's going on. The Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial and, and, uh, and Charlie Sheen's latest interview. I just, oh, I don't no. know what I'm saying. Um, is, is that a real thing? No, no. Oh, I'm like, just, I'm going back to like early two, 2010s. Oh, I, remember, I remember that YouTube. interview. I was like, there's, yeah, there's, that's what I was referencing. I was trying to intentionally be outdated with my references, make my age uh, myself. Yeah. Dude, boomer. Um, we should call the podcast Boomer Talk. Just boomer kidding. time. So stupid. <laughs> boomer yeah, time. Yeah, I think it's just JT Music Podcast. Yeah, just um, JT. Simple. For people who want to listen, they can listen. And well, you- it felt like a right time to do this. It's like, I think we have a, I think we have a pretty good rapport back and forth. And I feel like a lot of people, throughout all those gameplays and vlogs, their favorite thing was the dynamic between us and not so much the content they're seeing. Yeah. And so this was this is a great space where you can hang out for an hour and a half or whatever and listen to us shoot the shit. Um, we will, I think I mentioned at the top, but pulling interviews. Um, yeah. And you know, I think we'll always strive to have someone here in person. I think you can't beat that energy mm-hmm. and it's always a good excuse to fly someone in for a night and hang out and, and just have a record a time. podcast and then go back home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it's a, uh, I think this will be fun. And we've, we did the game finity thing. We pushed that to 30 episodes. That was fun. And then we started a movie podcast and, um, you know, that's been at it for 110 episodes and it's still going. And I think, you know, everyone and their mama sh- starts a podcast these days. And, you know, you, I think you guys, you can be confident that this one will be here to stick around. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've started things and they didn't pan out and whatnot, but I think this is something that we want to stick around with and just do because it's cathartic. It's good. Co- yeah. And it's fun it's, for us. It's like fun that's, for us. That, that's I like, I want to do this. I'm excited yeah. to do this. It's going to be just fun to do. And like, just like with our YouTube channel, we started doing it for us. So yeah. for sure, for sure. Also on a side note, even though everyone and their mom does have a podcast now, I found that with my favorite podcast, I'm always looking for new ones to fill up my, yeah. to fill up my day. I listen to them when, when I'm at the gym. So, uh, whenever I'm lo- I, I can't find a podcast. I'm thinking, damn, I wish there were more. So it, I'm trying to validate us making another podcast yeah. because people are always looking for them. Well, I'm on the other spectrum. I'm a one podcast guy. Oh, you're uh, a one podcast yeah. guy. Gotcha. I had dude was- soup for a while and then. I don't think I had one for a minute, and then now I'm listening to Spitting Chicklets. Nice. Yeah, I don't know. It's just like I, I only because I, I also like to balance audiobooks is my thing. Mm. So, yeah. be in the but. be somewhere in the middle at least. Don't be like me. And if <laughs> you are like me, make this your podcast. Yeah. Um. But thank you guys for listening, yeah. and uh, please give this a five a fat five star review. For some reason, if you do it and you show us tweet us a picture of you doing it, I'll uh. I'll I'll send you a five dollar gift card to Starbucks. Uh, I don't know. That's how we, that's how these things grow. Is you got to have the five star reviews. So that'll be my incentive. Yeah. I'm not gonna do it for everyone, but if you send me proof, hey, well, well you we'll, could get a five star. I don't five, know if that's illegal, but we'll keep it on the down low. Five stars for five star bucks. There's something that's there. yeah. Five that's stars it. for Starbucks. But yeah, it really does help. So please leave five us stars five for star. Starbucks. Five dollars. I don't go. know. Um, well, thank you guys for hanging out, listening, and uh, and we love you. We'll see you. May the stars be with you. Bye. <laughs> yes. <laughs>